Learning about the lives of queer women in Vancouver in the 70s and 80s really makes us feel so grateful for the safety and freedom we enjoy as a lesbian couple today. It's also pretty incredible to hear those stories from some of the people who literally built the community we're a part of. So now we're moving into the 90s and 2000s era to see what more we can learn about queer Vancouver. We know it was a very politically charged time back then and a lot of progress was made. So how did it happen? How did the community continue to grow and evolve? really can't talk about lesbians without talking about sports. So we're going back to our queer historian to learn about the impact that sports had on the culture of the community back in 1990. You know, not everybody is politically inclined. Um, and uh, of course, bars are important. Um, so we, you know, in queer history, we talk a lot about social venues where people hung out and met. But, you know, ball teams for women, so, so important. My name is Carol Delenko. I am an active, thriving member of the LGBTQ community here in Vancouver, Canada. I joined the Maple League, which is a, a women's fast pitch softball league here in Vancouver as a way to meet people. And it was really through the Maple League that the community started to grow and there was an expansion and more of an inclusion of all different types of um, women in the community uh, coming out and playing ball. Shortly after that first softball season, in 1990, the Gay Games arrived in Vancouver and it was, it was like a hallelujah moment because all of a sudden, on our city, um, descended communities of people that, oh my gosh, I recognized myself in a lot of these people. I saw myself, I was reflected in some of the other athletes that were in town. How did we not know that Vancouver was host to the Gay Games, a huge sporting event that featured thousands of queer athletes from all over the world? This definitely seemed to be an important turning point for queer representation and visibility in the city. The Gay Games in Vancouver was really large and there were so many different sports. It brought the lesbians and the gay movement together. It was really a, a wonderful time. I knew quite a lot of lesbians who played volleyball, so I went to the lesbian volleyball games. So I remember that about the gay games and I also remember just walking on the seawall here, all the gay couples. It was, it was beautiful. It was great. You know, everywhere you looked, there were, you know, gay people walking through Vancouver holding hands and, and that feeling, I, I, I can get goosebumps now thinking about the opening ceremony at the gay games that year. And it was just incredible to experience the whole BC Place, I guess it was, um, just filled with people. This is the largest sporting event for the year 1990. And it belongs to us. So what did this shift mean for Vancouver? And how did things change after the gay games? It sounds like this was maybe the first time the city really embraced the queer community. So it was definitely a pivotal moment in our history. It was like a massive healing and nobody wants to go back from that because it's, nobody wants to go back to the clubs. Once you've been on the street and you're open and free and can hold your partner's hand. Yeah, the gay games were, um, it was life changing for the city. I think it was a huge shift in the social fabric of our community. And I think it really set the stage for uh, Vancouver being a welcoming and inclusive city. It's like erupting out in a public space and you're safe and you're happy and people are happy with you and joining you because you're happy. So yes, it was a transformative moment. It was a, such a positive rallying cry and y y there was just kind of a euphoria in the air. And that's when everything started to change. It seems like the early 90s were a time when the community was really coming out of the shadows and living life out in the open. Queer couples in Vancouver were becoming a lot more visible and many of them were starting to have children. This point in time is what many refer to as the gaby boom. 
It was just the start of the sort of turkey baster babies and, and that kind of stuff. And I did uh, inseminate with a medical practitioner and never got pregnant. We always joked about how much money it cost to because, um, of course, it wasn't covered by BC Medical or anything at that time. And, you know, the wait lists and stuff for adoption and the fact that there certainly you couldn't come out and say you were a lesbian and then try to adopt. So it was probably about five months later that um, a friend of mine at work said that they were going to Romania to adopt. And it was like, what? You know, and, and she was a lesbian and her and her partner um, decided to do this. Anyway, we just kind of looked at each other and thought, oh, hadn't thought of that. I was on the plane to Romania all by myself in uh, September of 1990. I came home with not one, but two babies. I had adopted the kids in Romania. We weren't up front and said that we were a lesbian couple who wanted to have a family. And so we had gone off to see a lawyer in Vancouver, a lesbian lawyer. So we wanted to do a joint adoption and this lawyer laughed her head off. She said, not in our lifetime, sister. So she said, well, we'll apply for joint custody and guardianship. We did the joint custody and guardianship in the judge's chambers. And then once the word was out that we had got it, everybody else, they went forward and got that as well. The ways that queer people create their own families will always be such an important part of our culture finding a chosen family in the community, raising children as queer parents, and many other things that go against societal norms are all such a big part of the queer experience. It must have been so exciting here in Vancouver when queer families started to get some legal recognition. And it's really cool to think about the generation of kids that got to grow up during that time. There really did seem to be a like a gaby boom, as we called it. So it was really a fun time to be a parent. It just, you know, when I think back, I feel so positive about our parenting experience and, and the fun we had with all of our kids and, and our chosen family, you know, and potluck dinners and weekends away at Manning Park. You know, they had a pretty nice life. We wound up being sort of almost the poster family for the LGBTQ community and not because you know, we wanted notoriety or publicity or anything like that. But it, it, for me, and I think for my, my wife too, I think it was, it was political. It was, you know, we'll do it, put ourselves out there. And um, so I think it, it they, you know, we had to have somebody that was gonna do it and we had nothing to lose. In the 90s, as the community was becoming a lot more visible, it sounds like people were really standing up for themselves and their right to be queer in the world. One of our favorite examples of this in Vancouver is the story of the protests at Joe's Cafe when the lesbian community stood their ground on Commercial Drive. 1991, Commercial Drive, an Italian neighborhood, but also a lesbian neighborhood. Lots of lesbians live in this, in this neighborhood and hang out. And one of the most popular places for them to hang out is a cafe that still exists called Joe's. Lesbians were very frequent customers there. And one day, uh, two lesbians were there and they kissed each other and the uh, manager or owner, I'm not sure which, ejected them from the cafe. Bad idea. You don't want a bunch of lesbians protesting. To have a place that was a safe space to go, because it was until that point a safe space to go and meet someone and be on the drive. There was just this spontaneous uprising of protest. This caused a massive outcry in the community and some folks decided that Joe's should be boycotted. Yes, protests. I mean, we had all kinds of protests. It was a big deal and everybody had to boycott. And a boycott is pretty exciting because, <laughs> you know, a lot of people get to come together and they get to use their power, you know, and here you have something that's not like an international conglomerate, but a local business. So you can really make an impact, right, by using your voice. So I think it's a pretty, in terms of political organizing um, and visibility and so on, lesbian pride, it's a pretty uh, powerful movement. And it was like a clash of cultures. Yeah, it was amazing to think that what an uproar that was created out of two women kissing. That was 1991 and that was still the kind of reaction. What happened at Joe's Cafe um, opened the eyes to a lot of businesses that you just don't do that. And of course, now it's law. Just 30 years ago, women were getting kicked out of a business in Vancouver for being queer. 
As soon as we heard this story, we knew we needed to make our way to Joe's Cafe and have our own personal protest right outside. This may have been a pretty big turning point, when businesses in the city realized they needed to start welcoming the queer community and even advertising themselves as queer friendly. Before the internet, businesses were advertising through traditional media, so queer publications were the perfect way to reach the community. The launch of the Extra West newspaper around this time was hugely important. My name is Mel Woods. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. Uh, and I am an associate culture editor at Extra Magazine. So in 1993, Pink Triangle Press launched Extra West and Capital Extra. And so these were offshoots of Extra targeted at the local queer communities in Vancouver and in Ottawa. At our height in the 90s, we had 20,000 issues bi-weekly with an estimated like 32,000 readers. And so it became just this go-to news source for the LGBTQ2S plus community here in Vancouver at like a community level. And the ads, they were ads specifically, not necessarily just from queer businesses, but from businesses that wanted to serve the queer community. We're, we're here for you or lawyers or, you know, these basic kind of services, whether they were run by queer people or run for queer people. Having a space to advertise those services to queer people, I think, was also such a, a valuable asset during that time. You know, when you're publishing a bi-weekly newspaper every two weeks and you're so specifically just about issues that matter to LGBTQ2S plus folks in the greater Vancouver area, being able to report on these kinds of issues with empathy and with humanity coming from that community about these things makes for like richer storytelling and makes for more connected storytelling. And so I think the stories that Extra was publishing around these issues that were such big things that they were coming, being covered by the mainstream press are a lot more intimate because it actually has access to the people who are most impacted by it. And it's coming from a voice of saying like, this is our community. These are the things that are happening to us. Queer media really was so important to the community because mainstream publications just didn't have a genuine understanding of queer issues. Our greater society still had a lot of fear around queer culture at that time, so even with the progress that had been made over the past couple decades, there was still a lot of bias and discrimination. A huge example of this in Vancouver's community was what happened through the 90s with a queer bookstore called Little Sisters. Everybody was very aware of what was going on with Little Sisters and the and the fight with the, about banning the books and bringing them over the border and and um, you know it was yeah it was a big issue. You know it was on the front cover of Extra often of what the latest update was on the court case. Um, there would be op eds in there. Everybody was very well informed of that and it was well advertised and you know people you know made donations and stuff too. Um, you know, be able to help support the legal battle to fight that. Even though there were still struggles through the 90s, Vancouver's queer community was growing and it kept getting stronger. So we're wondering if there were more queer spaces in the city at that time, and especially spaces for queer women. I'm Lee Keppel. They, she, them are my pronouns. I'm your typical ex-military business professor, festival producer turned stand-up comic. Then, as now, there were a little bit the, the two communities. There was the gay scene, and that was the more obvious thing, the, the nightclubs like celebrities and numbers and... Pump Jack. This was a, a time that um, the Davy Strip was really kind of where you went. If you were coming from another city, you just went there because there was the rainbow flags up and and you'd see the drag queens and you just kind of you find your way there. And so that's where I went to. There was uh, celebrities, there was the Odyssey, there was the Dufferin, there was this, these downtown spots that, that you could bounce around to. There was um, segregation within our community. You kind of went to your space, like I went to the drag community. There was a drag community, and then there was a leather community, and then there was the lesbian community. It took a little while of, you know, kind of wandering along Commercial Drive, where are the lesbians at, right? And uh, to find that scene and realize there was this great nightclub, uh, the Lotus, and that was kind of it for spaces. 
You know, there was a, a lesbian cafe, Moonbeans, also for a while on the drive. No more, because the whole, like, we can't have nice things, apparently. You didn't have the apps on your phone to connect with people, so you had to go out and meet people. And that's sort of when I came to Vancouver. I, I really love that excitement, was to be able to be part of that. Uh, you know, it was a really interesting time in the 90s because there, well, we didn't have the internet. That just didn't exist. Social media these days, oh, click, 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 you got a party happening. During that point, there was actually um, a lesbian information line and it was a phone tree. You would sign up for the phone tree and you would get a voicemail message on your answering machine. And um, when you got that message, you would have two phone numbers and you would have to share that message and leave it either with somebody else's uh, answering machine or talk to them. And that is how information got shared. It was a phone tree. It was basic, but it worked. And outside of that, it was you know, scouring through Extra West or Georgia Strait or looking at posters and figuring out where community was. The very first lesbian event I remember going to in Vancouver, there was just like a really humble poster, I think, up saying, you know, lesbian party Saturday night. People would leaflet and poster and, yeah, you know, on, you know, telephone poles and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, you would know where to go if you wanted to see what was happening. You'd look at the, you know, aerial books on their, on their bulletin board or um, at various other spots, you know. I, I think the 90s was a really beautiful time uh, in terms of our generation being able to find its voice. Uh, being able to find our footing as a community in LGBT in Vancouver and in Canada. It is a luxury to be able to be whole and to be able to be myself. And in the 90s in Vancouver, we found that. There were so many big changes that happened in the 90s, including a lot of political advancements, like the queer community gaining human rights protections through anti-discrimination laws. Then moving into the 2000s, we started to see more changes for queer couples and queer families. The law around adoption changed in BC. My partner at the time had two daughters, so I legally adopted them. When there was some organization around equal marriage, you know, we thought about it. We thought, okay, this, this could be really challenging. It could be dangerous even. We had some of the, the top constitutional lawyers in Canada working for us. And so, yeah, so that sort of prepared us for all the potential opposition that they were anticipating. And so, of course, a lot of, a lot of it was coming from uh, particularly the religious right. And then the other opposition, which was a bit surprising for us, actually came from the queer community itself. There were, understandably, people who just did not think marriage was a good institution to be a part of. We were, you know, having this opposition saying that it would, you know, would ruin gay culture, and it was happening in the queer media. The editor of the Extra West at the time was very opposed to gay marriage. You know, we didn't have the same sort of social media. The only queer publication that was out was Extra West, so it had it had influence. They did eventually come around to see, you know, seeing that yes, this is an this was an equality issue, but it had a lot of influence. The Equal Marriage Act passed in BC in 2003 and across Canada in 2005, and it's so interesting to hear that there was some opposition from within the queer community at first. Ultimately, marriage equality here in Vancouver is the result of a lot of hard work and help from many different people. And we're so grateful for it. The reason why we're able to be legally married today as a lesbian couple is because of the people involved in that long fight. Yeah, it was just a huge high for, qu for quite a while, actually. All four of us went to Toronto. We met our lawyer from Kingston, Kathleen Leahy there. Uh, she arranged to get uh, one of the Supreme Court judges to marry us in the courthouse there, which was pretty special. We got asked to be witnesses at so many weddings. There were people coming to Canada from all over the world to get married. All these big changes really are proof that politics matter. And during this time, a lot of queer people were fighting for political change and getting into politics to create that change from the inside. In the 2000s, we started to see it on the local level, with the queer community and the city of Vancouver really working together for the first time. There wasn't really a place for the LGBTQ community to speak at City Hall, and there was an advisory committee that was set up, the Advisory Committee for Diversity Issues, 
And uh, somebody on Vancouver Pride um, board suggested that I step up uh, to this position because I could represent the community. So I did um, and was a proud member for two years of this committee, was the vice chair of the uh, diversity committee. And we actually created the first work plan uh, which was for the city to start funding Vancouver Pride. And someone asked if I could, would run for city council, that I realized if I could get on council, I could do much more than I was able to do as, a, as an organizer. So I did run, and in 2002, we won the election. We won a clean sweep of Park Board School Board and Council. Tim Stevenson, who is an out gay man on council, and I started calling for the LGBTQ Advisory Committee, we hosted Stonewall in the council chamber. Mostly what Tim and I asked for, we got. So the next year we hosted Pride at City Hall. We painted the steps, rainbow colors, and had speakers. It was really a statement, this city is your city too. This is a city is all of our city. And it really opened things up and businesses felt more supported. Sex workers felt more supported. I was able to get council, uh, the mayor's office, to do a trans uh, statement, and I took it and marched in the first trans march, which was held in the downtown east side. So it was like, we're part of the people, and we have a council and a mayor that is going to speak out on the issues. All the work that was done over these decades really shaped the community as we know it today. Our Queer Vancouver is a result of protest and organizing and activists in this city, and we are forever indebted to these generations before us. While there's still more progress to be made, sometimes we just need to remember how far we've come in such a short time, because it's pretty incredible. There was a lot of shift and a lot of changes, and a lot of people started coming out and stepping up into this community. And because of their effort then, Today, we reap the benefits of all of the effort and the time and energy. Remembering that the level I entered at was paved by the efforts of those who literally took it on the chin for me. You think about um, it's the people that didn't have anything to lose, but they had everything to gain with being themselves, you know, and their strength in that. From that, we've got a lot of community leaders that are recognized today. Of course, when you're in the midst of doing those kind of things, you're not thinking about we're paving the way for, you know, everybody else behind us. But yet there was that a bit of a, a risk. And, and, you know, in some ways, I think we had a responsibility to do it. And to understand that we function as a society, as a community, um, that we're all interconnected. These are stories about what happened in the city that have almost been forgotten. What makes our community so strong is when we have the people that have found their confidence to share their stories of how they found their place. That's visibility and that is encouraging the people coming after us to see and to hear stories that will allow them feel like they're not alone. I know we've got a long way to go but we've fought and we've advocated and we have stood on the streets with our placards and our voices and we've made change and i really hope that the generation today takes our message and carries it on because nothing happens if people don't step up speak up and show up we're grateful to have learned so much about the city's queer past and especially the lesbians and queer women who built the community we're a part of today we really do hope that our generation recognizes all the work that was done. We owe Vancouver's incredible community to our queer elders, and we can honor our history by sharing their stories and making sure they're never forgotten. Mm -hmm.